listeners, it's Not So Giant Women back with you today for season one, episode 21, entitled Joking Victim. Now that's a title. <laughs> yes, that's a cute one. This suggests to me practical jokes gone awry. Uh oh. <laughs> well, I guess we'll see how literal it is. Yeah, which doesn't sound like a healthy thing to happen in Beach City. No. Okay, well, I guess without further ado, I'll. We're going to watch it. Yep. Here we go. Are the crystal gems? We'll always save the day. You were absolutely no help whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Funnily enough, I, I can relate to some things that happened in that episode. Oh. <laughs> well. <laughs> but first, I'll recap it for the viewers and listeners. Sounds great. Uh, Stephen is just kind of Stephen around where Amethyst comes <laughs> up to ask him if he wants to try some special fries. So <laughs> he tries the special fries and they've been seasoned with fire salt, which is incredibly hot or spicy or magically hot and spicy, which causes him to turn red and puff smoke and has to run into Big Donut and try to... Cool his palate by unloading the soda machine into his mouth, which spills everywhere. <laughs> Amethyst thinks this is hilarious. Over making a mess in Big Donut, Lars starts to clean up but claims he has a terrible back injury that means he can't do that or indeed anything else. So Sadie says maybe he should go home, which he eagerly does. Sadie realizes she can't handle Big Donut by herself, so Stephen offers to sub in for Lars. This includes watching a How to Big Donut instruction video made by a young Mr. Smiley. When I say video, that's videotape, which Sadie explains as like a DVD in a box. So we're looking at that strange level of audiovisual technology in Beach City again. There are a number of catchy slogans and instructions as to how to manage Big Donut and conveniently the words pop up on the screen if you find yourself habitually singing along but not knowing what the words actually are yet. And Mr. Smiley, it seems, was not previously a Donut employee but he was an actor slash R&B singer. Over the day of Stephen's employment, Sadie reflects how Lars can be a good person like the time he asked her to wait seven hours in line for a video game he wanted because he'd been banned from the game store and <laughs> when she turned up to give it to him he gave her some of her favorite snack food and they stayed up all night playing that game together though so Sadie's reaction in the case it may not have just been playing the, the game together <laughs> but Stephen could only comprehend so mm -hmm. so much and <laughs> To be fair, it does seem like they played a lot of the game together because they talk about it later and Lars calls Sadie player two. They figure maybe it's time to do something nice for Lars. They pack up some donuts and go to Lars' house where they find that he is in fact in perfect health, bouncing on the trampoline with the cool kids and he says in so many words that he got the day off because he faked a severe back injury, leaving the situation pretty unambiguous. This obviously hurts Sa Sadie's feelings and she talks about a number of times he, Lars has burned her and Stephen cottons on to this and says he knows how to burn Lars in return. He says to Sadie, wait right here, then realise it might take a while and said that she should probably go home and they'll meet tomorrow at work. Tomorrow at work, the, Stephen has got some of the fire salt from the first scene and is putting it, volunteers to put it on a donut and feed it to Lars. What? Sadie thinks this m might be a bit much, not least because it's tampering with the donut. However, at that point, Lars comes in still dramatically faking his back injury and saying he can't work today either. This makes Sadie angry enough to put a lot of the fire salt on the donut and they feed it to Lars. At first, it does not do anything. Then once it kicks in, he turns red and smoky and starts literally breathing fire and Runs, for, runs from the store in extreme pain and breathing fire as he goes. Once they've literally put out the fires in a donut shop, Stephen and Sadie head down the boardwalk following the trail of small breath fires that Lars has, Lars has produced. 
They catch up with him. Sadie tries to take him to task for his actions and attitude, asking him if he just called her player two because that meant she could be could have been anyone. She appears to somewhat get get through to him, except as he's choking on the last of the fire donut, the video instruction about what to do if a customer is choking a donut kicks in for the nearby Stephen, and he tackles and I guess Heimlich's the last of the donut out of Lars's throat, which Sadie extinguishes. And <laughs> Lars, Lars starts to calm down. He appears to feel some regret for his actions, offering to help Sadie. And Amethyst, by the way, is, well, apparently still in the same place from yesterday, but still thinks all oh, this is hilarious. He's just watching the drama. Lars and Sadie go away, presumably to, well, possibly just continue the loop of their incredibly unhealthy relationship. And Amethyst takes some credit for saving the day while Stephen reminds her that she didn't actually do anything whatsoever, to which she says, eh, <laughs> and we go to credits. Yep. Hmm. Now, the relatable part for me in this, believe it or not, was actually the fire salt, because <laughs> some friends of mine found some incredibly spicy, we're talking proper 15, 16 out of 10 corn chips, that at least one person had to leave work sick because they tried. Oh, no. And while, while no one's pranking anyone like Stephen and Sadie are, they are blisteringly spicy and hot, especially if you're just thinking, I can handle this, it's just a corn chip. <laughs> and one of my friends thought exactly that and totally chowed down and was pretty much red-faced and just drinking whatever he could find to try to cool himself off. And it was very, very much like the fire salt victims in this episode. Oh, no. That sounds terrible. <laughs> it, it, ki- it kind of is. <clears throat> I've tried to play. And I'm someone who's used to spicy things, and I found them very hot. This was someone who thought, I can handle this. I heed not your warning and just grabbed a bundle like they were just regular corn chips. Mm. And it, it did not go well for him. And I could just not help but be reminded. I yeah. kind of hope no one has been using these for pranking like in the episode because that could go very wrong. So they and, just look like normal chips. Yeah, they're not even like red or anything. Yeah. And they've they got warnings all over the pack. And we, whenever anyone offers to try and they say, no, look, these are really hot. You might not want to try them. But So in yeah. some ways, the people are pranking themselves by assuming that they, right. can, they could just How do what the heck ever. <laughs> yeah. I definitely believe people if they say things are spicy. More because for me, it's usually the opposite. Like people are like, this is not spicy. Don't worry. It's not. And it's too spicy for me. So I stay away from anything that could possibly be in the realm of spicy. I don't even want to walk by the place where they're cooking it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I was going to say I'm the opposite, but I'm not that much the opposite that I'm... <laughs> Just going to munch down on these things or mm. mainline fire salt. Mm-hmm. So maybe you, maybe you would be, maybe you would be the amethyst in this episode, just eating it in front of people. <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> just you know, special. probably one dose for me, one dose for everyone else. That seemed to be her method. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably wouldn't uh, prank a child. <laughs> no, no. It's kind think, of mean sometimes, you know? She doesn't know where the line is. Yeah, that's kind of peak amethyst that she yeah. just thought how funny it would be before. He's lucky Stephen bounces back because yeah. he managed to fix himself in like a minute, whereas yeah. poor Lars had to be heimlich <laughs> and extinguished. And yeah. they did a great job of conveying what it feels like when you've gone into something that's way too hot for you in that way. Yeah. I, I don't know if Lars had a more severe reaction because he ate more of the salt or because he wasn't half gem, but yeah. either way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Stephen knows Amethyst. How could he see her going special fry? You want some special fries? And he's just like, do I? And just <laughs> eats them. How, oh, come on, Stephen. You know better than that. <laughs> yeah. But he doesn't. Yeah. That's- <laughs> As we've reflected before, sometimes Stephen just does not learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As you were saying in your summary, one of the things I really like about this episode is that there was a lot of subtext and you could see that Stephen wasn't getting it. He wasn't catching on to stuff that the rest of us were seeing, especially for adults. Yeah. And, you know, not just the 
reference to where where he's like, what must have been one great video game. She's like, yeah, it was, and just kind of looks away like, mm-hmm. we know what you were doing, Sadie. Yeah. But, and oddly enough, even like a lo- uh, several other adults that I've talked to did not catch that. But here's a couple of ace ladies going like, oh, yeah, they did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're ace, not blind. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. We, yeah, we were paying attention. So, but besides, besides just that, I mean, it seemed like, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't notice that Sadie was jealous in a very specific way when she's like, you snuck off with some other girl. And he goes, and other boys. Yeah. (laughs) He doesn't really get that this is sort of a romantic, even though he ships them, he wants them to be together. He thinks they're already married, but he believe he doesn't really understand that this was like a, a thing where Sadie felt betrayed, not just for the lies and not just for him skipping out on work, but that he lied to her and then this is what he was doing. Yeah, and that he did seem to be paying particular attention to Jenny Pizza. To Jenny, yes. Mm-hmm. Although some people have thought that he has a crush on Buck, but who knows? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's really hard to tell sometimes because he's just, he's doing... He's doing such a, an aggressively overcompensating kind of dance to try to impress them all. So, Yeah, and Stephen is not going to notice the multitude of indicators that whatever the status of Lars and Sadie's relationship, it is not one of a healthy history. That's right. Yeah. You know, this isn't one of my favorite episodes, but I do really appreciate how character oriented it is and how realistic it is, like with complicated relationship aspects to all three of them, actually. Like, I mean, Steven is Steven, but he's see- he's seeing like Lars is not in the shop. So he's like, I can help. And that's that's also peak Steven because he's like, I have no idea how to help you, but I can help. And, and <laughs> So, but, you know, he's seeing that, you know, especially when Sadie was upset about things, he was like, oh, let's figure out something that we can do to try to make this better. You know, first it's, hey, I'm going to bring Lars some donuts. But then after that, you know, when it turns out that he's a jerk and he's lying, he's like, he's an accomplice in pranking him. (laughs) So it doesn't quite occur to him that if you're after taking revenge pranks on your friend or would-be partner or whatever, chances are that means things aren't going well to start with. It's it's not something most people do to each other, <laughs> or at least right. not, not people who are in good relationships of any kind to do to each other. Right. Yeah. It's really, it's really complicated in a not great way. <laughs> like it kind of plays into that whole trope where especially women are usually in these relationships where they want to fix a guy they want to um, yeah it, it, it's their little project and you know they'll downplay all of their jerk aspects and say you know i didn't mind at all standing in line for this guy for seven hours he got himself banned from a shop you know i mean i don't know how he did that but i could imagine yeah i was gonna say i I could guess i I don't think it's a genuine misunderstanding in which he is actually the wronged party right right so you know but she's willing to do stuff for him and then she feels like he did something for her because he cleaned up his room a little bit and got her oyster crackers you know like it's kind of sweet that he even thought of her and didn't just take it for granted completely. And he did seem to be at least a little bit receptive at the end, but at the same time, he just, he really has been using her and taking her for granted. And he would clearly rather spend his time with other people. He does not think of her really as completely as a person, you know? Yeah. He's quite happy to just blatantly lie to her two days in the concession about wanting to get out of work. And that's not only getting out of her presence, that's leaving her to handle Two people's work, basically, because he doesn't know Stephen's going to mm-hmm. end up there and right. be apparently quite good at donutting, but maybe not from coffeeing, judging by Sadie's expression. <laughs> Plus, you see her say, I cleaned the last five Stevens." <laughs> that I love that Stephen is just, <laughs> it's just become a noun for a kind of instant big donut, which yes, I readily believe. 
I mean, you know, if your name is synonymous with accident or mess, that you're doing it. Yeah, I would imagine Stephen himself would probably get banned from that store if it weren't for the fact that he is providing them with so much income. Mm-hmm. Probably. He's certainly been banned from some of Mr. Smiley's businesses, so. (laughs) Yeah, but Smiley doesn't seem to mind when he sees him in the donut shop, so obviously he's not personally mad at him, at least not at this point. Right, yeah, he just banned him from his rides, because in fairness, he did break that ride by jumping off of the teacups. (laughs) So he probably thinks, oh, maybe Stephen will do better at this. Whatever, it's not my donut shop. Yeah. And in fact, this is one business we know he doesn't have a hand in because they actually said so. All he he did was appear on the video. Right. I thought that was maybe a little bit, I don't want to say in poor taste, but like it's kind of a low blow for them to say like, oh, he used to be an actor slash R&B singer and like the voice actor is Sinbad. And I'm like, oh, are they taking digs at him? Like, (laughs) it's kind of mean. (laughs) Yeah, and he goes, used to be. <laughs> yeah. Or Sinbad might be in on it as some, some celebrities like to make yeah. jokes about themselves, which... Some of them like to roast themselves. You're right. Well, it's like what they've said about William Shatner, that since he stopped taking himself seriously, he's become the world's best William Shatner impersonator. That's funny. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. So I, anyway, I guess talking, still talking about Lars and Sadie's relationship. For a lot of it, he seems a little bit one-dimensional, like, oh, he's just a jerk all the time. And there's a little bit of depth toward the end, I guess. But it's like, I was wondering about when, you know, he's jumping on this trampoline and trying to impress the cool kids. He assumes that saying he lied and faked a back injury is going to make them think he's cool. And they actually do. They high-five him. So I'm Mm. like, huh. He just wants a relationship like that where... He's going to have friends that are respecting him for lying and cheating and being bad. And that's how he sees himself, I guess. He doesn't want to be some loser who works in a donut shop. Oh, he probably doesn't want to be a loser who works in a donut shop. He probably wants wants to get paid for it nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Assuming these people have any kind of sick leave. I I don't know how the Donut Workers Union of Beach City works. (laughs) Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah. donuts seem to be such an essential service in the city that, you know, maybe you don't want to disrupt it too badly and you want to keep the people providing it happy. <laughs> yeah. So, but I guess we just end up seeing, of course, a lot more of Sadie and her perspective and kind of the more she says about it, you know, you're right. You just, you start to see sort of the unhealthy way she thinks about it and how like, she really, I really like Kate Micucci's voice acting during that part where, where she's clearly like just so upset that she's seen hit the evidence of Lars's lies and he's hanging out with other girl and stuff like that. And she's just beating herself up and the, the way that Steven reacts to it, he just, he's got this face on, like he doesn't, he didn't expect that at all. He doesn't know how to comfort her. And it's really just complicated and just these complex sort of feelings on these are very simply drawn characters and it, it really impressed yeah, definitely. me. Definitely. Yeah. And a lot of them. <laughs> I can't say at this point, because of course it's pretty much, it's all but the last thing we saw when Lars is having his regrets at the end, is he genuinely becoming aware of his behavior and thinking it might've been bad to hurt his friend or is he doing, is he performing the minimum necessary action to try to st- stop Sadie from being from manifesting her anger at him so he can continue to do the same thing which is a thing that happens in abusive and manipulative relationships so this could actually be something pretty hardcore for an 11 minute children's show oh yeah I think uh, they do understand the dynamics of abusive relationships and I don't know quite how hardcore they're implying at this point that they're going with that but I think it was admirable for Lars to not lash out at Sadie for what she just helped cause like what he just went through and then he's willing to actually still listen to what she said but you also kind of get the impression that she doesn't do that a lot she doesn't tell him how she hurt she feels hurt you know like it, it seemed almost like she kind of crossed the line and said to him, do you just think of me like I could be anyone? I could have been any warm body, <laughs> you know? And he knows how bad that sounds. And he has to work with her. Mm. So 
But yeah, Which, you might be right though with him saying stuff like, uh, you know, I, I want to help, but I understand if you want to be alone, you know, kind of like the way that he voiced that was whatever you want is, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever the right answer is, is what I'll do. <laughs> yeah. So anything about that, I guess we've really got to see what happens going forward. Going forward, has he learned, well, more, which lesson has he learned? Mm-hmm. But he could have learned quite a terrible one from the events of this, which is you just have to throw Sadie a few token bones and she is sated and you can go back to mm-hmm. doing whatever the hell you want. Yep. yep, after all of that. And then she's just like, no, I'll get you some water and get you out of your burnt shirts. And she's any level of effort from him is is indication that, she shouldn't just throw the whole thing out the window. <laughs> mm. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. It's complicated. Uh, so Garnet and Pearl were not in this episode and I was sad. <laughs> uh, and in fact, oh, Amethyst was as much just a conduit for fire salt. Yes. <laughs> and establishing a notion of pranks. That's right. Uh, she didn't even need, she didn't actually need to be there at the end, much as Stephen said. Or she was just, <laughs> kind of capping off the episode and reminding us that the gems, the gems exist. Right. Because you could have easily <laughs> concluded, concluded that episode without seeing Amethyst again. She mm-hmm. didn't like provide any magic solution of, oh, if someone's this severely injured by fire salt, then we have this other thing which we wave at them and it cures them, which yeah. there may well be such a thing, but Amethyst isn't going to bring it. No. <laughs> and that's why this could only be Amethyst providing that cameo at the beginning and end because I don't think the other two would I did, well I certainly don't don't think they'd trick Stephen into eating fire salt and they probably wouldn't just sit back and laugh at the drama at the end absolutely not <laughs> but our mm. amethyst totally in keeping yes she has kind of done the same sort of thing before like I'm, I'm thinking of the onion episode in the onion trade when she ends up inadvertently kicking off a bunch of chaos by giving Steven something a gem related gave him that replicator wand and havoc ensues so in this case I'm sure that he got the fire salt from her somehow so well knowing her her maturity he probably just said said can I have some more fire salt to prank someone here you go yeah (laughs) yeah she didn't seem to recognize why donut guy was breathing fire so but yeah, she. I'm sure she would be on board. I'm thinking about in, in the episode Frybo, for once, Steven got the artifact that caused the mischief from Pearl and not from <laughs> Amethyst. But it's not like she gave it to him. She lost it. She didn't know where it went. So it went in his pants. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's unusual. <laughs> That's unusual. Yeah. I have to tell you my favorite line from this episode. And it was when they walked into the back room and he said that it was the most magical place he had ever seen. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, it literally isn't Stephen. Yeah. It's just, it's so funny to me though, that that really brings home that there are human aspects, like everyday human aspects of his life that are just as brain explodey to him <laughs> as seeing like a gem cave or some kind of cool uh, gem power. Yeah, well, people literally teleport into and out of his house every day, but he's never mm-hmm. seen a donut employee room before. And it's very much like a real world kid that when you're of that age that Stephen is or of that mindset that Stephen is, that this yes. is a peek into an adult world where yeah. where the donuts come from and where the grown-ups <laughs> go to and from. Yeah, they're seeing the secret workings of something. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I remember actually kind of feeling like that at my first job. I'm like, oh my God, I get to go into the kitchen of this restaurant. I was the same when I did some help in a library once. Mm-hmm. But I, it was a big one and had those, pretty uncommon these days, but like those messenger tubes where you put like something in a little capsule and it shoots across the building. Mm-hmm. And to my like, however old I was self, that was just amazing that I got to look at these things in action. Yeah, it was magical. <laughs> How about the reference to the accident? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they just don't say anything else about yeah. it. That's all you need to know. That's, Fill in the yeah, that's why I don't make the donuts there. <laughs> it's funny. 
So I guess, I mean, since they don't have to make the donuts, they basically just run the storefront and stock. Pretty much just do the actual donut selling and some administrata. Mm-hmm. You probably have to put a dog nut together every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> make sure that things are arranged appetizingly. Mm-hmm. Clean up the odd Stephen. Mm-hmm. Brew coffee. Yeah, brew mm-hmm. coffee. Stock napkins. <laughs> napkins are always free. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, plainly, that's the music. That's the song from this episode. Is the oh yes, the big donut employee rap. I, yes, whatever. which that was, was very was... catchy. I was managing to sing along just with the bits of words that popped up on the screen in the video, and not quite realizing. Wait, I don't actually know the words to this, and I'm somehow singing along. Yeah, that's when you know that you've made a memorizable song. I mean, the, the realism of that is very on point because, I mean, a training video like that would be constructed so that you would remember all the pointers and stuff. So, And it worked for Stephen. He, it he sure did. knew how to unchoke Lars. Yep, yeah. I've never seen something like that, like a human breathing fire or doing something, you know, reacting to gem stuff like that. Hmm. No, and... I'm used to when someone breathes, breathes fire and from spice in cartoon, it's usually like yes. figurative, whereas yes. no, he is actually combusting things around him. But it's magical gem fire sold. It's right there in the name. Yeah. At least he didn't actually burn up his face. I mean, no. that would be awful. No, he's probably lucky he got off as well as he did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that Sadie was... In, the ba- in that back room, she was sitting there. She mentioned that sometimes she goes there and w- watches a uh, canine court. And then later she was actually watching canine court and there was a dog <laughs> as a judge. Do you think that's based on anything specific? I didn't recognize a reference. No, I could see the possible influence of just shows like Judge Judy and the various mm-hmm. you know, real court things that are particularly popular for daytime television. But right. Dogs, I don't know. Someone just thought, hey, let's have dogs in it because that would be funnier. I can't, I, I couldn't think of what it might be referencing. So I was wondering if you knew anything. They yeah. probably just made up something weird. <laughs> yeah, no, I just think of your Judge Judy, Judge Wapner stuff and someone went, plus dogs. <laughs> Judge Barkner. I also really like when Stephen is trying not to laugh and spoil the prank when he's about to, and Lars is about to eat the donut and he's just trying not to laugh and his face is like blowing up and he's exploding trying to hold his laughter back <laughs> and, and then he's like yeah you said it was hot and huh. we th- and we the only thing is this going to be subverted is he going to at the last minute decide he doesn't feel like a donut yeah and when it doesn't <laughs> kick in for a moment you're going oh has he got some amazing tolerance for spices and things. No, it just takes a while to kick in on him. Right, right. He's just like, new flavor or something? <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> huh. I was trying to figure out if some of those faces Stephen made were Paul faces. I think they are. <laughs> they were definitely Paul-esque faces. There was a lot of that this week, I noticed, in the animation, <laughs> whether it was he himself, certainly there were similarities. Yeah, I I think it might have been him. This is a Raven Mollusy and Paul Vileko episode. And I have seen some storyboards because every, every once in a while they'll share storyboards. And the ones from the first half of the episode were from Raven. So I'm thinking the latter half was Paul. <laughs> That's supposedly how they do it most of the time is they split them up, draw half an episode. Probably a legit Paul face. <laughs> Yeah, while I was while I was fidgeting, Stephen's first fire salt reaction is on screen, and everyone, especially Stephen, is kind of very rubbery. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Raven likes to stretch people out too. <laughs> uh, I think I heard somewhere. I am not sure where the primary source of this is. I could probably find it if I looked, but I've heard that Raven Mollusy really wanted to write about Sadie and Lars's relationship. And that's why she's on a lot of the ones where it's Lars and Sadie. Mm-hmm. And even the ones like Tiger Millionaire, Raven was on that one. And Lars and Sadie are in it a lot. <laughs> so. Well, as we said, there's a lot to unpack with those two. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Really old characters of Rebecca Sugars. I think I've mentioned that before, that she created them, like, when she was in college. She would doodle these people, and she really liked the idea of making some stories about people who are just kind of living in everyday life and the minutia of that. Yeah, well, they're a step away from being, like, their own Adult Swim Mm. series. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Mm. Let's see. What else do I have to tell you about this episode? Mm. That I No, I, I already told you the part of the thing that I liked the best about it. I, I didn't want to forget to tell you my favorite, my favorite line, and I told you. I also really liked when he says, and other boys, but we talked about that too. <laughs> yeah, doesn't quite get it. Yeah, and the DVD shaped like a box. I like that <laughs> line too. <laughs> Especially since we've talked about the technology a few times. And I couldn't tell if, because he asks, what is it, when she shows it to him. And instead of telling him what the content is, she explains to him what a a videotape is. (laughs) So I wonder if she just actually legit thought that he didn't know what a videotape is. Probably thought, oh, these children who don't understand older technology. (laughs) Yeah, I think we underestimate kids sometimes. Like yeah, they know what that is. I, f- I find those kids react to old, older technology videos kind of frustrating because, like, where are you finding these kids that don't recognize picking up a phone? Because right. These kids are like teenagers, and it's despite what the video is telling, we still have phones like that in use. Yes. Mm. I definitely saw one where, like, a couple of kids couldn't figure out how to use a rotary phone, and... I can kind of understand that because if you've never used one, it is not user-friendly. It's yeah. not like intuitive as to how to complete. Makes it's not sense. a button yeah. to push. <laughs> but, you know, they didn't know to pick it up either. So, mm. Mm. But, but at least most VCRs, like, they'll start playing when you put the tape in. You don't even have to push play. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess the most is you might put the tape in backwards if you weren't familiar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I could see that happening or not knowing what to do if it was in the middle of a tape and you didn't know how to back it up. But the idea of rewinding is pretty foreign to some, some children, some Mm. people who are not familiar with the technology because I mean, cassette tapes and videotapes, they need to be rewound and discs do not. Yeah. So apparently audio cassettes are seeing another resurgence for some reason, because all of the advantages I can see in it taken up by something even easier. Mm -hmm. So you're not gaining the sound quality. And the other main feature it used to have was it was easy to create and distribute, but now it's even easier to create and distribute in various digital methods. That's right. So I don't know, at the risk of aging myself, I guess it's a bit of a hipster thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, problem with cassette tapes is they definitely deteriorate and they're fragile too. They jam all the time. I mean, I remember so many times in my childhood if a tape jammed or got pulled something and I would, I would try to like manually cut out the part that was crumpled up mm. and uh, keep it back together and hope that I didn't. Anyway. Oh. Well, so of course we did talk about the music. <laughs> It's called Do or Do Not. Of course. That was just that was the thing on the screen. Do or Donut. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know why, but it's not on the soundtracks. If you buy any of the soundtracks, they don't include this song. And I guess it's probably because it's chopped up. Like, it's... Mm, probably it's doesn't got, exist as a complete track. Yeah, like, I guess they probably didn't make something that sounded continuous enough and they just didn't include it. And that makes me sad because it's fun. Like, I'll be sitting, waiting to cross the street and I'm singing this song to myself like, oh no, it's happening again. <laughs> like I said, I was bumping along to it and I hadn't even heard it before. Mm-hmm. That's how catchy it is. <laughs> you know, I didn't ask you a probing question yet. Let's see. Nothing really obvious comes to mind, but I'm going to try to do something about how Amethyst was in the episode and Garnet and Pearl weren't. So we don't know what they were, what they were doing while Amethyst was sitting there eating fries and laughing at people in pain. So, okay. So 
it was in Arcade Mania when they were like, oh, where's Garnet? Oh, you and Pearl's like, you guys know that she goes off and does missions without us all the time and stuff. So I was wondering what would, like kind of what's your opinion? What's your thoughts on like, do you think sometimes Garnet and Pearl treat Amethyst the way they treat Steven and like leave her behind on missions and kind of what the implications of that might be? Maybe. I mean, I can see that sometimes there might be missions where it's just, oh, we need to do this into it. It's just such a basic one. Whoever's whoever's in the room when they get the call or whatever <laughs> yeah. is just the one that goes on it. And if it's just one or both of them and Amethyst isn't there because, as established, she has far more outside being a gem warrior life than the other two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it could be that mundane reason. Mm-hmm. It is possible also that Amethyst simply blows off missions herself if she'd rather not be on them. Right. She seems aware when some things are very serious, which probably means she's aware when some things are not serious and is happy to Mm -hmm. leave the others to it. Right. Like, so maybe it's a question of, is she just ignoring her responsibilities at this point or has she basically been told, yeah, we don't need you for this. We're going to just do it ourselves. Yeah. I don't think that, quite as dismissive enough to say, no, let's not tell Amethyst about this because it would be a bad thing to bring her along. Mm -hmm. She rarely seems to actually jeopardise missions, per se, that most she seems, when she's actually on one, she seems to be slacking rather than actively destructive. I mean, certainly she's had her moments, but... Right. You know, Pearl screaming at her for like, you got too close to blood polyps and they, how did I know, how should I know they'll pop? And yelling at her about her, her, her antics. So I imagine that if they do sometimes leave her behind, it's because Pearl doesn't want to deal with her. (laughs) Well, yeah, I imagine sometimes if it's a Pearl specific decision, then she's not in a hurry to fire up Amethyst speed dial or whatever. (laughs) You know, I I was wondering about this, like, and kind of what you what you thought of it, sort of in the earlier part of the show where we are now, because kind of around this time is where fans started to try to figure out some of the inner workings of their dynamics, and everybody's kind of seeing what you saw is that she's Amethyst is she acts like she's younger, she acts like she's the kid sister kind of mature one, and like somebody pointed out probably a lot of somebody it's pointed out that in the very first episode they're trying to teach Steven to pull out his shield and he gets the rose petals going and you know like what, what Pearl taught him and Amethyst goes did Pearl tell you the petal thing <laughs> and that implies that she's been shown the petal thing and people were saying was there a point where Pearl tried to train Amethyst in the same thing like is she, was she ever kind of the Steven of the Crystal Gems and now that there is this Stephen, it's much more apparent that like they're these competent warriors, and he's this squishy organic child. But it, it's it's a question that has been floating around for a while as to how much difference is there between them, and is Amethyst kind of the uh, the one that they, that is by their standards still learning? So I don't know. It's something they've picked around. <laughs> Yeah, I've often tossed up whether Amethyst, despite being countlessly old by human standards, is still young by gem standards, or whether this is just what she's like, regardless. Right. (laughs) And we don't actually know much about the history of the gems, particularly these three gems and how they came to be a unit. Also, Mm -hmm. we don't know if maybe, yeah, she really is younger and they discovered her as a gemlet, a baby gem, a pebble or whatever the young version of a gem is called and sort of raised her to her current <laughs> adult-ish status uh-huh. or, or was everyone much like they are now and they were just brought together by circumstances. Mm-hmm. The most we know is when they were in the shark picture, <laughs> which was a few hundred years back, but even all that really tells us is that they were together that, that few hundred years ago rather mm-hmm. than Rose. <laughs> how they got there or, again, how long they'd been there. Or in fact, if, for all we know, the quartet may have separated and come back together since then. I mean, we picked up that Rose was part of, or well, basically would be part of our main quartet if they hadn't been reduced to a trio by her giving up her physical form to Sire Stephen. 
Uh-huh. But yeah, I pretty much get the impression that at least until Reese, until Stephen's birth, it was the four of them rather than the three of them. Uh-huh. But again, before that is pretty much a blank slate to us at this point. And mm-hmm. so we're not even 100% sure where they're getting these missions from, if they're just poking around and finding, ah, just spotted something that needs done, or if there's still some kind of entity or body that is dropping messages like, you know, that there is a, a gem walrus monster off on this magical island in the South Pacific, so you all better get down there and calm it down. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's definitely not a lot of information about how they decide what they're doing, how they decide when there's a mission and when it's dangerous. And But it definitely doesn't seem like Amethyst is out of the loop the way Steven is. Like, she seems to know what they're doing and she doesn't question like what's going on all the time like he does. So it always seems like she's a bit part of the trio, but you know, sometimes it just seems like she's goofing around and not, not doing anything. So it's yeah. like, eh. she's, she's certainly a competent gem warrior. She just yeah. doesn't take it nearly as seriously as the other two. Yeah. And, and I like there, that about her. <laughs> and if there aren't that many gems to go around, they might sort of go, well, she's kind of the best we've got. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You could see that. If there are other active gems as in people we're not seeing them mix with our main club a lot right mm. Mm. Oh. what do you say i tell you about my food yeah i was wondering where we we're going to go with food considering this episode mm-hmm. if you were going to subject yourself to some fire salt substitute well the answer is yes but i did it in a sort of roundabout way. One of the very first things I ever made when I first started to recreate recipes from Steven Universe was fire salt donuts. And of course, I wanted to make fire salt donuts that would not be painful to eat. So I had absolutely no designs on trying to actually make them spicy. But, you know, I just went out and bought some donuts, which, you know, if a big donut doesn't have to bake their own donuts, neither do I. And... Mm-hmm. <laughs> I put some pink frosting on them. The way that they look, it looks like there's kind of these yellow shards in there. It, it doesn't say what they are, but these crystals that are yellow as well as the pink sparkly stuff. So I got them yellow rock candy and I broke up the crystals and put them in there so that it would look all like scary and, and spicy. Put some sugar sprinkles of different colors and then I added to make them sizzly and you know, seem like they were on fire i put pop rocks on them ah and you can I knew these donuts <laughs> when i first saw the fire salt donut i thought that that looks familiar somehow and i couldn't place it but you're right it looks like pop rocks good call yeah and i have a couple funny stories about these first is that i made the first time I made them, I made them before a new episode was going to be shown and I was going to take them to my friend's house and eat them. And it turned out he hated Pop Rocks, so <laughs> he didn't eat them. I ate them. But I tried to make them the night before, which was a bad idea. Don't ever do that. Because Pop Rocks, as it turns out, they are activated by moisture. So they begin to sizzle and then they stop sizzling when they've just turned into syrup. They eventually just turn themselves into syrup and oh, get soggy gross donuts. <laughs> and they're certainly not sizzling anymore after a few hours, but I was, I was hearing them sizzling all night long. <laughs> like, I want to go to bed. Shut up, donut. So I added some more Pop Rocks in the morning, but they were still much more cough syrup red than I wanted them to be. Ooh, the, the second idea of weird tasting thing, Pop Rock donuts, though. I want to taste Pop Rock donuts. Oh, you know, they are delicious. They're actually just legitimately fantastic. And the really weird thing about it is when I first decided that I wanted to make these donuts, I didn't think about the Pop Rocks. And then I happened to see some in the store while I was shopping for other candies that would look right on the donut. And uh, I was in like this gourmet grocery store that has a really awesome candy department. And I was there looking for the yellow rock candy and saw Pop Rocks. I'm like, ah, I know what I'm going to do. And then I found out some, quite a while later, the people who make the show, you know, some of the Crewniverse members would celebrate the release of a new episode by making food from, from the episode or inspired by the episode. A lot like 
what I do. And they made fire salt donuts and they also used pop rocks. They came up with the same wow. idea and I did not get it from them. <laughs> so I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like a, an approval. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I didn't know if anyone would even believe me because they made, they made these so much ahead of when I did. So um, I did actually relatively recently, I decided this is an oversight on my part that I haven't actually tried to make fire salt itself. Like fire salt as a spice is a real thing, but it doesn't look or act anything like what we saw in the show. So I I figured this is not some kind of spice that you add to stuff. It's a liquid. It looks like a bubbly liquid and it's in a test tube. So I, I am this extra. I went and I got some plastic test tubes and I made test tubes that looked like this with little jewels on the outside of them so that they would look like <laughs> the fire salt tubes. And I mixed together hot sauce and pepper flakes and pepper. I mix those together and I put them in there and I put them on French fries. And believe it or not, I ate some Ooh. and I did, I did survive. <laughs> I posted a picture of me trying to eat them and somebody noticed, they said, are you crying? And apparently my eyes were watering enough that there was water on my face <laughs> and I didn't even know it. And I, I just answered, why wouldn't I be? <laughs> But I don't handle spice well. But I also had just ruined a bunch of fries if I wasn't going to eat them, so I ate them. Oh. Uh, this was one of the bravest acts I've ever committed as a Steven Universe fan, wow. having pot playing Garnet in public. That uh. is dedication to the bit, Ivy. Yes. So I did that. But I also did kind of a third surprise recipe for this episode. It's a oh. recipes. I made the largest bowl of ice cream. <laughs> Of course. I kind of jokingly asked my friends, like, do you think that I need to gather together a record-breaking amount of ice cream to be able to say I did this recipe? And my friends assured me that I could make a miniature version. So I did pink ice cream. So I got some raspberry sherbet. And nice. I had the shell chocolate on the top, like the picture. A little cherry on top, like the picture. And I built a ridiculous little string fence around it so that it would look like oh. it was cordoned off. And I put a little paper Mayor Dewey figure next to it for scale to make it look huge. <laughs> I'm like, look, it's the biggest bowl of ice cream in Beach County. <laughs> I'm ridiculous. Unlike Mayor Dewey, you understood that ice cream can melt. Yes. <laughs> it melted, Gary. You should have said that at the meeting. <laughs> of course, he wasn't expecting somebody to breathe fire into it. Definitely notice that Mayor Dewey is drawn like his actor in this episode. <laughs> it's really funny. I wonder how often that happens. Well, often enough mm -hmm. the TV Tropes has a name for it. They call Ink Suit Actor. Oh, I've <laughs> never heard that one before, but I'm not surprised it's on TV Tropes. That's hilarious. I love that. <laughs> oh, largest bowl of ice cream in Beach County. So I actually ate that on my birthday. <laughs> nice. I'm like, yeah, I think this is a good recipe for a birthday person. I wore my, my, my cape, my birthday suit. <laughs> Paper Boom. crown. So, yeah, I was not disappointed that some of it melted. It was delicious. I still haven't finished all of that ice cream. I need to eat more. <laughs> <laughs> it was relatively recently that I made that one. There's actually a Sadie does eat some oyster crackers in this episode while she's watching Canine Court very briefly. So, technically, that is a recipe I have not replicated. But oyster crackers you can just buy in the store. So. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, yeah, they're probably just around. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have bought some before as, you know, intentionally as a Steven Universe reference, but I served them with something else. So It did, and this is something of a tangent, it did remind me of a gag in the film we reviewed on the other show on Podsploitation yesterday, in which an unsuspecting pescatarian is offered what they call mountain oysters on a farm. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and I guess you know what mountain oysters are. Oh my gosh, I knew. That's like sheep balls, right? Yep. <laughs> Which I didn't okay, know until like, I watched I don't that. know the specifics though. Like, how are they like fried or something? They look like oysters? I don't know much either, but they, in, at least in the movie, they look like they were fried and maybe dipped in something. And yeah, the character, the character just thought, oh, oysters, all right. And so they're, yeah. 
Then she was very believe that, but <laughs> <laughs> then she was told a few chomps in what that actually means. Oh. So when it no. when oyster crackers were brought up in this episode, I was like, I'm going to assume she means actual oyster crackers. They're just shaped like oysters, as far as I know. I'm not sure what they're made of, but people oh, put thought, them in. I thought they might taste like oysters. Well, or at least kind of like oysters in it, much as crackers taste like their supposed flavors. You know, I don't know that I've ever had an oyster. Well, same. And I haven't actually, re- I've had prawn crackers a lot and they don't seem to taste like the few prawns I've managed to have. So, Oh, hmm. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. weren't even prawns because I was allergic to prawns. So I had to get fake prawns. Oh. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think that I'm right about the oyster crackers just being the shape, but, but I'll have to double check that. I've eaten them. <laughs> Uh, let's just hope that they don't secretly have fish in them. A lot of cracker flavors like that not only don't have their supposed meat in them, they don't actually resemble the meat in any <laughs> way whatsoever in taste. Another of my vegetarian friends eats a lot of these chicken crackers that have no actual chicken remnant in them, but don't mm-hmm. also don't taste remotely like chicken. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You know, it's been such a long time since I had any like actual real meat that sometimes people ask me, does it taste convincing? If it's like a meat substitute or something, I'm like, I legitimately have no idea at this point. I could say yes, but (laughs) you know, I'd have to have somebody who had recently eaten it because I haven't eaten meat in over 20 years and it's hard to remember really. There There are some fake meats that taste just like the real thing. And some that very much don't. Yeah. (laughs) But I think that's probably a good thing to have because there are a lot of vegetarians who don't want it to taste like meat. Mm. So we sometimes get made fun of for wanting to eat things that are trying to be meat. It's like, why not just eat the meat? But, you know, you know why. (laughs) Yeah. It was last night that I first properly ate prawns. They weren't really prawns. But now I'm told this is what prawns actually taste like. So. Ah. Well. I've got a couple more segments for this episode, which one of them is the factoids and one of them is the merch. So what should I do? <laughs> Let's go alphabetical factoids first. <laughs> As I mentioned, it's a Raven and Paul episode. See, I, I wrote down the tagline. Okay, when, there it is. When Lars pawns off all his work on Sadie, Steven helps out by working a shift at the Big Donut. Mm, that's not that bad. That's vague enough if... <laughs> You could easily just think that the episode was going to be about the troubles Stephen got into trying to work as a donut worker rather than all of the rest of the stuff. And Mm -hmm. you wouldn't even know the relationship stuff was going to pop up because Lars pulling off his work on Sadie is something Mm -hmm. we would expect to happen even by this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can definitely tell that he is the one being carried at work. (sighs) Um, Even without any depth to their relationship we you, we know he's quite happy to get her to do something instead of him <laughs> absolutely we can just know the type and we can fill in all of the blanks ourselves okay what else was there there's there was there was a deleted scene i remember seeing one of the storyboarders post this i, I mean I, I imagine this happens all the time but they had originally planned uh, and they had to cut this for time that you remember when Sadie is saying, oh, it's, it used to be a summer job, but that was two summers ago. Like right before that was where the scene was. And you see Mr. Fryman leaving with his, his son, Petey, on his shoulders. They're just, they bought some donuts and they left. But there was a little bit of dialogue between Petey and uh, Sadie and Stephen oh. and Mr. Fryman. And they were talking about, I guess, uh, you know how Petey was like talking about getting a job and stuff in his episode. And now Stephen's got a job. So they were talking about, you know, you've got someone gave you a job. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he, Stephen reveals that he's been thinking of innovative new donuts that he could have. Oh, no. including putting French fries into a donut. And Petey is very offended. And he's just like, you better stick to donuts. And, <laughs> and Mr. Fryman's like, Sorry about that. He's a little bit territorial. He gets it from his mother. We've never heard <laughs> Mrs. Fryman mentioned, so I'm kind of interesting that there was a mother conceived in his family. So, but they cut all of that, and I've only ever seen it in storyboards. Kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, they suggest that the Fryman children didn't just hatch out the back of the fry shop somehow. <laughs> Maybe they just get killed from a potato. <laughs> 
would explain the curly fries hair. You you may not know about this. You didn't mention it when we were talking about the catchy song and stuff, but those that video was based on real real training videos from Wendy's. <laughs> okay, I didn't know it was that specific. I knew such things broadly <laughs> existed. Yeah. A library I used to go to for reasons I do not know had a bunch of ones, a bunch of British ones with various mid-level comedians in them. So I, oh, wow. I, knew, they, I knew they existed, <laughs> but yeah. I didn't know this was so targeted a parody. I, I believe there's probably like one or two very specific ones that are from Wendy's that you can find on YouTube that uh, this kind of pulled inspiration from. But it, was, it had that feel like where everything was a rap in the 80s to get the kids mm. to listen to it. And it had to be cool, and it had to have these terrible effects and <laughs> the, the transitions between. Yeah. And sort of throw colors at the screen. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, there was some very long training video where they're, they're, they're wrapping all of their instructions and trying to get you to learn how to be a Wendy's employee. Which, <laughs> embarrassing as it is, would make it kind of stick in your head. Oh, sure. I mean. As we saw this week. I mean, now I know that there's a 6% sales tax on edible goods. <laughs> yeah, and that napkins are free. Yes. Good thing. And in that back room, there was another factoid. There was a Purple Puma and Tiger Millionaire poster still up. Oh, I didn't catch them, but that's cool. <laughs> I think that's adorable. It, it kind of suggests like Lars is still really into the wrestling and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's a fan. <laughs> He's a fan of Steven and he doesn't know it. Yeah. It's cute. Um, As explored, Lars just doesn't get that. He would be the one saying, no, Clark wears glasses and Superman doesn't, so what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would be extremely dismissive about the really obvious truth. That's just a theory. It is a dumb one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He even actually kind of said something like that, if I recall correctly, in Tiger Millionaire, where he didn't think he looked like Steven at all. Speaking of Lars, I think my last trivia-ish thing was the the scorpion shirt he was wearing in his play clothes. It looks a lot like one of the enemies in one of the video games. They have these little light constructs that look like various bugs and stuff. This like really looked almost exactly like the enemies you have to fight lots of minor enemies in the video game. And this shirt he was wearing looked like that. And I heard somebody say this once, I'm assuming this is true, that he's now wearing a scorpion shirt because Buck didn't like his snake shirt. So he has to wear a scorpion like a steak shirt. <laughs> well, he has to. That be sounds cool. very Lars. He has to keep up with being cool. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that he had a trampoline, and he's like inviting his cool friends over to jump yeah. on the trampoline. So, kind of an atypical cool thing to do. Yeah. Well, knowing him, maybe one of the cool kids just mentioned it in passing, and he just ah. moved heaven and earth to make sure he had a trampoline. <laughs> Also handy to us that the first thing we see him doing is something you would definitely not be doing with a back injury. That's right. Yeah. I think everybody was wearing their shoes. And whenever I've gone on a trampoline, I was told to take my shoes off. Yeah, there are trampoline centers here and taking shoes off, big rule. Yeah, they all had their shoes on. <laughs> oh, well, they're rebels. Yeah. There's you, four of them on a tiny little thing at once. What are you teaching the kids at home to wear shoes on the trampoline, Cartoon Network? Yeah. Next thing you know, they'll all be shirking work and lying about their back <laughs> and setting stuff on fire. <laughs> Brand spanking new mint inbox. Oh, I have two merch items today. I'm breaking oh. format. Oh, double dose. I kind of didn't want to do this, but at the same time, this is the only episode where he was working at the Big Donut, so... I have my Steven in a big donut shirt toy. Cool. This is cute little Steven, and it's from the Titans, Cartoon Network Titans line. And it is exactly like the Steven that they make with standard. So they just recolored him. Yeah, he just gave, <laughs> gave him a new shirt with the D for Donut logo. Yes. I, I like him in that shirt, I've got to say. Yeah. Apparently they, they messed up and drew him with a star a couple of times during this episode. But, you know, you get used to it. And my coffee mug is a big donut logo today but it also has mr smiley on the other side with this <laughs> donut thing so i was like i can't not do this for this episode no that is perfect <laughs> <The song. laughs> so it's the same logo for people who can't see this 
uh, <laughs> the same logo as the opening of his video where it says do or do not with yeah. Harold and, Smiley. And now that the now that the donut logo is up close and personal, I can see how they've t- turned the chomp into a, a B shape and the rest of the donut makes the D. That's right. For a big yeah. donut. Yeah. I happen to be wearing my fan made shirt that has a donut logo on it today. <laughs> I saw that peeking up the edge of camera, and at first I thought it was a, a tie to two, a yin yang. <laughs> oh, well, it's this. I, I actually oh. bought it for a Sadie cosplay. I, oh. I was Sadie for Halloween in like 2015. <laughs> As I am short and blonde, and could make a pretty decent Sadie. I curled my hair. My oh. hair is not curly at all, so it had to be curled. Was, was your hair as long? In 2015? It wasn't quite as long. I cut my hair in 2014. You like my chin. So <laughs> it, was, it was a little longer than Sadie's, but it was, it was doable. Cool. Uh, never did it at a convention, but I did do it for Halloween. So very easy, comfortable cosplay. I did have some donuts to uh, go with my costume. <laughs> I didn't have a Lars, though. Mm. So well, on the birthday. shape of... On the shape of things, Sadie's probably better without a Lars, so I think you did okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. Considering the type of show this is, you can be assured without any spoilers that they're going to continue to uh, show us that developing relationship. So we'll see them again soon, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, it's not like Steven's going to give up donuts. Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> Even if he wanted to, it's in his backyard. Yeah. <laughs> right there. Oh, I actually that's, that's, used to live really close to a donut shop and it was hard to resist. <laughs> yeah, I think I've mentioned before, but there's a Krispy Kreme outlet in the 7-Eleven, just like a mm. block or two away from where I am. Mm. And that's a similar temptation. Yeah, that, it was a Krispy Kreme where I was too. And you would just, I'm trying to walk home from class when I was in college and you just smell that. And I'm like, I'm not going over there. I'm just not doing it. Mm. But, you know, very, very hard to resist. Yeah, and in my one, since it's in a 7-Eleven, you sort of, you've got to get milk anyway, and since I'm here, that's when it becomes even <laughs> tempting to s- slip some donuts under the, the fences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder if the Gems chose, if they had any choice to matter, to put the treehouse that close to the donut shop, because they thought, oh, he'll need food, so we'll put right near this place that sells food. We are responsible guardians. only thing I can think of that might be a counter to that is uh, in beach party pearl said the temple had been there for thousands of years uh, true. <laughs> so i imagine the big donut has not <laughs> no no <laughs> but the house is a different story so hmm. the question is why did they put a big donut so close to this giant statue <laughs> oh maybe it's the other way around maybe they knew Stephen lived there <laughs> no we may or may not see more of this gee (laughs) Uh, I think I'm done talking about the donut shop and Lars and Sadie how about you yeah I think I've covered all to immediately cover about this episode it's reflection moments maybe one day we'll really know what canine court is (laughs) someone likes putting dogs in things for the beach city media with dog copter and canine court that's right and we've got lots of cats too yeah. they like pets yeah. the, puppy bowl is probably, horse. the puppy bowl is probably bigger than the super bowl in beach city <laughs> i think you're probably right no yeah. well that's the end of my thoughts yeah and mine so i guess all that remains is to bid our listeners and viewers farewell until they rejoin us for episode 22 right (laughs) see y'all next time bye bye (laughs) you've been listening to ivy and daria on not so giant women you can find episodes of the show in video form by looking up Not So Giant Women on YouTube or in audio form at anchor.fm slash not so giant women or your podcatcher of choice. You, you can, can also, also find us, us on Facebook. Facebook. Audio production by Daria. Video production and music by Ivy. Daria can also be heard on Postploitation, the Ausploitation podcast 
and Ivy at her Steven Universe fan blog at love-takes-work.tumblr.com. Steven Universe was created by Rebecca Sugar and remains property of Cartoon Network. No infringement is intended.